Okay, so this is the pancast for Spring 2008 Physics 101 Midterm 1 Question 3 where we are asked to consider a mass moving on the outer surface of a cone. And initially the cone is at rest, so it's not rotating, and the block does not slide down the surface of the cone because of static friction. And we are given the coefficient of static friction between the mass and the cone, the distance of the cone from the axis of the, the distance of the object from the axis of the cone and the inclination angle for the cone. Now, let's start with part A. It says, draw a free body diagram of the block. Since the block does not slide down the cone, what's the relation between the coefficient of strict static friction and angle theta? Hmm. So, here actually this is not different from considering just a single particle, just a particle on an inclined plane with mass m. What are the forces acting on this object? Well, there is the weight of that object and there is the normal force acted on by my cone onto this object and the normal force is always perpendicular the surface, right? So the angle here is so theta. Now, if those were the only two forces, this object will start sliding down the cone. So there is the friction force acting on the object to hold it steady. Now I can write Newton's equation, Newton's second law, both in the direction parallel to the cone and also perpendicular to the cone. Now, that angle is also theta, right? So, what I'll do is I'll actually write the in the direction perpendicular to the cone, m must equal mg cosine theta, so that there is no acceleration in the direction perpendicular to the surface. The object does not jump off the surface. How about in the direction of the surface, parallel to the surface, my friction force must cancel with the parallel component of mg, mg sine theta. So that's great. But what do we know about static friction? Static friction force must always be bounded by coefficient of friction times the magnitude of the normal force. So in this case everything is positive so I have mg sine theta must be less than mu s mg cosine theta mg both are positive numbers so what I actually have is tangent theta must be less than mu s both of these are dimensionless quantities unitless quantities so this makes sense and if I have a flat surface like theta is very small or zero so it's easier for this object to not slide if I have something approaching 90 degrees I'll have very I'll need very high coefficient of friction to prevent sliding down so this is part A how about part B hmm now we're asked to consider this object this cone to be rotating when the cone rotates I have almost the same, well I have the same forces acting on this object, right? I have mg, I have F friction, and, and. but now the object is not stationary, it actually is an accelerating object, it's stationary with respect to the cone, but according to the ground it's actually moving with some acceleration. What's the acceleration? Which direction is the acceleration? Remember, the acceleration actually points towards the axis of rotation. So there will be an acceleration. What's the formula for the, what's the magnitude of this acceleration? It will be V square over R. So, in which case, I actually have to write omega square R well not R, it's D, right? 
Okay. So, there is an acceleration towards the center, which is omega square. Now, first, let's do the following. Uh, let's remember what my angles were. The angle here is theta. The angle here is also theta. So, let's first write in the y axis, acceleration is zero. So, n cosine theta plus f friction sine theta is zero. Not zero, it's equal to mg. But in the y direction, f friction cosine theta minus m sine theta must equal ma, which is m omega square b. So, what do I want to do? I want to solve for n and f friction separately from here. So, what I'll do is I'll I have my first equation, my second equation, and multiplying them both with the first one with cosine, so I'll do this. And cosine squared plus f friction cosine theta sine theta with mg cosine theta f friction cosine theta sine theta minus n sine square theta is m omega square d sine theta first equation I multiplied by cosine theta second equation I multiplied by sine theta now I subtract these two equations friction terms will go away and cosine square theta plus sine square theta will give me n is apparently mg cosine theta not plus minus m omega square theta sine theta now I can do the same trick just in the reverse direction multiply the first equation by sine theta second one cosine theta and add so mg sine theta plus m omega square d cosine theta is a friction so what was my rule my rule was that a friction must always be less than mu n right so let's write this down m g sine theta plus omega square d cosine theta must be less than mu m g cosine theta minus omega square d sine theta hmm. so what I actually have to do is I'm asked to find omega square where this is no longer valid so I'll collect terms with omega square on the left d times omega square cosine theta plus mu s sine theta will be on the left must be smaller or equal to g cosine theta mu s minus sine theta on the right so omega square must be smaller than g over d mu s cosine theta minus sine theta divided by mu s sine theta plus cosine theta and at the critical frequency that must be satisfied as an equality g over d square root of mu s cosine theta minus sine theta mu s sine theta plus cosine theta that is the answer we are looking for dimension of the unit wise square root of g over d is a frequency we remember from uh, oscillations maybe maybe we don't it's not so important but it has the correct unit and all the things in the other square root have 
no units, so that's fine. And I know that equals mu s is larger than tangent theta from the first part. The square root is always real, so there is no imaginary frequency which completes our solution.